the show that reveals how extraordinary items in our world are designed, constructed and produced. See the engineering, the technology and big ideas that make the world go round. Find out how it works. Coming up in the show, with nearly two out of three Brits wearing glasses these days, we'll be focusing on wire-rimmed spectacles. Grown on trees and often served salt roasted, we'll learn more about the Iranian pistachio nut crop. And with a ready-made template, a saw and the hide of a water buffalo, we'll show you how to build a luxury leather chair. But first, often associated with hairy bikers, the Harley-Davidson is an iconic motorbike. They certainly have a famous heritage from Hollywood to biker gangs. But what goes into making this highway Hellraiser? Well, there are many secrets to a world-famous motorbike, but the one feature that is most often overlooked is the frame. The wheels, engine and handlebars need a solid structure to attach to. These steel tubes are perfect, lightweight but strong. Although the company started out in 1903, producing only three complete bikes in their first year, today over 500 frames are produced at this one factory every day. Robots are used to speed up the process and they help produce a high quality finish. In addition to the use of robots, some of the welding is done by hand as the machines can't reach some awkward spots. The completed subframe is heavy, so a crane is used to remove it from the workbench once it's done. The classic look often includes mud guards, and these are made using sheet steel. An enormous press shapes the steel into the traditional retro-style curves that are still a popular feature on these bikes. After the first press has molded the mud guard into its signature shape, another one cuts away the excess metal. The grinder removes the rough edges and it's ready to go. Another part of the bike pressed from sheet steel is the petrol tank. The tank is made of three different parts. Two halves separated with a middle block so that it can sit over the subframe that has just been built. A laser cutter slices the tank shape in half. This gives it a perfect edge for when it gets re-welded later. Because they'll be filled with petrol, the tanks must be built carefully. Some bike manufacturers hire other companies to do it for them. But at Harley-Davidson, they produce their tanks themselves. Taking great care with his hands, the worker operates the roller welder which joins the sides back to back. They now have a space in the middle to take the third part which fits neatly between the two halves. A spot more welding and the completed tank is nearly done. However, it's not just the build quality that's important. This worker's job is to ensure the new tank has a flawless surface, so it looks good as well as functions perfectly. Next, an engineer will take the finished tank, seal it and immerse it in this bath of water. If he sees a single bubble rise to the surface, the tank will be rejected. However, if it passes inspection, it can be sent on to the paint room. First, the different parts all have to be washed. The paint will only adhere to the metal if the surfaces are spotlessly clean. A variety of colour schemes are used. The workers will also tape up different parts. This means several colours can be used to paint one element, giving them a traditional two-tone effect. For that extra special retro look, additional coloured stripes are drawn on by hand, using these special templates and paint rollers. 
And finally, the badge of honor. Using a laser sight, the worker can line up the stickers so they are in exactly the right place every time. Gleaming V-twin engines now arrive at the factory. Their throaty roar is an important part of the motorbike's appeal. The bikes can now be built, the subframe is first, and the engine is neatly fitted into place. Next comes the petrol tank, wrapped in cellophane to protect its custom paint job. The shaped mud guards or fenders are added on, but there's one major component still missing. Ah yes, the wheels. Modern motorbike wheels are made of a solid lightweight alloy, but despite being a fiddle to clean, old-fashioned wire rims are still popular on some Harleys. When the chrome is in this brand new sparkling condition, you can see why. Keeping with tradition, the rims are fitted with white wall tires and slotted into place. Engineers need to test the finished products, but they don't venture out onto the open road. Instead, they open up the throttle and let rip in a closed room. Known as a rolling road, this device lets the engineer drive the bike at up to 130 kilometers an hour. Let's hope the rollers keep turning or he'll be leaving the room very quickly. The suspension is also very important. It's so tough that during World War II, these bikes were used as off-road vehicles. More than 80,000 of them were used as courier bikes during the conflict. Once complete, the bikes are shipped out to dealers all over the world. Immortalized in movies like The Terminator and Easy Rider, the Harley is still king of the road. Wire-framed glasses have to be tough. They've got a tough job, and considering they're only made from thin wire, they need to be well-built to start with. When you're making a pair of wire frames, you start with a design. To be strong, they have to be well-made, so getting the specifications right is paramount. With the plans complete, the frames can begin to take shape. This machine is loaded up with huge reels of high-grade steel wire. The lens dimensions and the wire are fed in, and the machine gets to work. To make sure the shape is absolutely perfect, a glass lens blank is used as a guide. The machine bends the wire according to the curves of this blank. Every few seconds, a new frame pops out to join the others but they're not finished yet. Any lens put into one of these would immediately fall out, but there's a double solution provided by the next piece, which is the hinge. When this is added, it holds the wire frame together and provides a place for the arms to be attached later. Now we've got a frame with a hinge, but that's a monocle. To make glasses, we need two hinged frames that are attached in the middle. This attachment is the bridge, and it's soldered into place using lead soldering wire. At 625 degrees Celsius, the solder melts and bonds the two sides together. These frames would sit on your nose like this, but they wouldn't stay there very long. So the next step is to add some arms. These are pressed from more steel wire, but pressing them like this gives them rough edges. So what's the solution? They're now dropped into an enormous vat with these cones and some soap. The cones are made of stone, and in combination with the soap, they rub away the rough or sharp edges. What you're left with is a smooth arm that won't scratch the side of your head. These arms can now be attached to the lens holders with the hinge from earlier. But as any glasses wearer will tell you, these tiny screws can go missing all too quickly. 
The manufacturers are continually looking for ways to stop losing their screws. Here in this department, a selection of new frames have been connected to a test machine, which opens and closes them repeatedly. In their lifetime, the average pair of glasses will open and close over 100,000 times. They can also experience a lot of wear and tear, from being grabbed by a playful child to being dropped when you're in a rush. They need to be tough enough to cope. To help improve their durability, the frames will receive a couple of useful additional layers. First, they're galvanized. This means they are coated in a robust outer layer of metal, which will protect them from scratches and rust. Next, they're varnished. This can be either applied by hand, or if there are a large number of frames, this machine can varnish many pairs at a time. The freshly coated frames are then baked in this oven. 14 minutes in here and they've got a solid coat to help them resist any damage. Now, your face and ears are quite sensitive, so the manufacturers add special rubber covers to the frames. There are two nubs where the glasses rest against the nose and the arms get covers as well. The bending stage comes next. This machine will curve the arms so they sit comfortably behind the wearer's ears. Almost everyone will need a pair of glasses at some time during their lives. So this is one industry with a clear vision of the future. Still to come, we're taking a look at the pistachio industry that employs thousands to ensure a steady supply of these salt-roasted snacks. And using a few yards of strapping, plenty of stuffing, a needle, some thread, and even a hammer, we'll show you how to produce a luxury leather armchair. The delicious pistachio nut. This is a snack that can be described as fiddly and time-consuming, but if you have the patience, the effort is well worth it. They're full of energy and bursting with flavor, but where do we get them from? You may not know this, but the world's biggest pistachio producer is Iran. They say money doesn't grow on trees, but this tasty cash crop comes pretty close. Over two million people in Iran work in the pistachio business, many of them in the plantations. The autumn harvest produces between two and three hundred thousand tons every year. The pistachio grows as a soft nut inside a hard shell. When they're on the tree, they look like grapes. The nut can be eaten raw and is said to be delicious. However, they don't travel very well, which is why most of the pistachios we eat in Europe are dried. Once the raw pistachios reach the production facility, they need to be separated from the husks. These machines can sort around 80 tons of nuts, but loading them isn't very exciting work. First, the nuts are run through grinders to break up the external husk. This is then shaken off to separate out chaff from the nuts themselves. The nuts are then bumped over a sieve to knock off any determined bits of husk. The next machine pokes the nuts with tiny needles. Pistachio shells have to be opened so people can get to the nut inside. Closed nuts are rejected. Sometimes the needles miss bad nuts, but these ladies help to catch the culprits that slip through. What they're left with is enormous quantities of raw pistachios. For the domestic Iranian market, the nuts are spread out in the sun. Unlike the UK, that is a resource Iran has plenty of. It takes about two days to dry them out. However, global demand means some producers use these enormous drying tanks. This speeds up the process to just 20 minutes. Now, before the nuts can leave Iran, they must be thoroughly checked. 
Pistachios can be spoiled by fungus, which produces poisons called aflatoxins. They're believed to be carcinogenic or cancer-causing. A sample from every harvest is sent to this state-of-the-art laboratory, where they're crushed to a pulp, which can then be tested. The diluted pistachio juice is assessed in high-tech machinery. The pistachio industry in Iran is huge, and the authorities are keen that nothing, not even a tiny toxin, does any harm to this successful business. When the scientists are satisfied, the pistachios can be sent on to the packing department. To keep the nuts as fresh as possible, they are vacuum packed before they take the journey to Europe. When they reach the factories here, the first step is to double check the nuts. Hygiene and food safety standards in Europe are far stricter than other parts of the world. Sticks, stones or any other jaw-breaking debris has to be removed. The first stop is this space-age cleaner. In this machine, the nuts are shaken while being blown around. The rising air carries away any light material, whilst the shaking drops any unwanted debris into a bin below. In this form, the pistachios are dried, but still raw and unsalted. The first step is a salt bath. One ton of pistachios is mixed with 100 liters of salt water and then shaken like a martini. It only takes about 15 minutes for the nuts to soak it all up. They're then poured out of the shaker and sent straight to the roasting ovens. The nuts don't spend very long in here. 10 minutes at 160 degrees Celsius is enough to roast them, which brings out their delicious flavor. Pistachios contain a rich variety of vitamins and minerals beneficial to the health, including potassium, magnesium and vitamin B6. The nuts are divided up by weight and dropped into the bagging machine below. They're sealed and sent to the stores. So, from the arid plains of the Iranian plantations to a cocktail bar near you, the healthy and popular salt-roasted pistachio nut. You know you've arrived when your night out involves a hot date in an exclusive club. The service and the ambience give off a feeling of luxury and success. But there's something else. Ah yes, a luxury leather chair to sit in. They may be one of the traditional parts of an exclusive members club in England, but these high quality leather chairs start life here in South Africa. To make one of these comfortable seats, you'll need a design, and these templates are where the workers begin. All chairs have one element in common, a structure. The worker will mark up his raw material, and this can then be cut into shape. Here, he nails two pieces of wood together so that when he cuts the pieces, they are identical. This will give the chair perfect balance. Woodworking can be a very dangerous business, so he has to take great care when using these saws. This worker has been trained to use this equipment because it could easily remove a finger if he didn't know what he was doing. With all the right pieces, he now has to assemble the frame. This calls for staples, screws and even wood glue to hold everything in place. He will now measure his work to make sure he has the dimensions right, otherwise the cushions won't fit. Traditional club chairs are deep with high arms and backs. This makes them much more comfortable for enjoying your brandy and cigars in. No, this isn't the well-lunched businessman. This is an Indian water buffalo and it's his skin we're interested in. A quality club chair feels old and well used. If you look at an inferior quality leather that's been dyed, you can see it's plain, boring and not very inspiring. For this luxury chair, the superior raw natural leather is preferred. 
it emphasises the antique look that comes with a members-only club chair. Ideally, each chair is made using leather from the same animal. It takes 17 pieces to make one of these chairs. However, the seamstress has to be very careful, because if she makes a simple mistake and damages one piece, the whole hide can become useless. To be able to seat the well-lunched businessman, the club chair needs good, solid support. The upholsterer who works on the chair next uses tough fibre bands which he weaves back and forth. This creates a solid foundation for the next stage, which is the springs. Made from wire, they appear very wobbly, but they will help improve the support for the cushions on top. The springs are made even stronger when the worker ties them together with an elaborate series of knots. While he's busy tying knots in his springs, the cushion man is also hard at work. A luxury seat needs a good cushion, and each one contains up to five kilograms of stuffing to ensure it's as comfy as possible. Here we see the covers being made out of the leather pieces. Thread is used that complements the leather's colour and great care is taken not to leave any marks. Now, although everyone's taking great care not to damage the material, the workers have to actually beat the leather to get it into place. The underside of the leather sticks to the foam padding. This is good because it means it doesn't slip but it does mean the workers have to be quite forceful in the first place. The whole chair receives a layer of padding underneath its leather skin. This protects it from damage on the wooden frame, but also makes the seat much more comfortable. The custom-made covering is placed over the top of the padding and then beaten into place as well. Everything should fit perfectly, assuming everyone's measurements have been correct, but there are always extra bits to trim and tuck away before the chair is finished. The final trick for the perfect handmade club chair is the seamless seal. These metal strips act like a zip and mean no one has to sew the leather into place. The workers tuck the edges into the seals which are hidden underneath. A few whacks from his hammer closes the seals without a single stitch. All that remains is for the company's test lab to try out the cushions before it can be sent on to the lounges of the finest clubs in Piccadilly.